Welcome this week in Missouri politics. After a very tumultuous week at the state capitol, we're joined by Senator Kurt Schaefer, the man who seems to always be in the headlines. Welcome this week in Missouri politics. Thanks for having me back. I love coming on the show. So let's jump right into it. Planned Parenthood, there's developments this week as, as the session closed for the week. Planned Parenthood finally responded to your subpoena. You had the first committee of the whole in over 100 years and you demanded some answers on what Planned Parenthood has been doing with baby parts. Give us the brief cliff notes of what happened the last 48 hours. Yeah, so this stems from last fall. We had the Sanctity of Life Committee, and I used the subpoena powers, the chairman of that committee, to subpoena both Planned Parenthood and the pathology group that they use to find out, in fact, what are they doing with, with babies who are aborted? Because that's kind of nationally the question that is just not getting answered in the debate that started with those videos that came out. Uh, last July. And so very rare to use a subpoena power. In fact, the last time it got used before that is when I used it to find out the concealed carry list had been given mm -hmm. to the federal government. And so we issued the subpoenas, both the pathologist and Planned Parenthood refused to comply. So even though it's rare to use the subpoena power, we can't find an instance where anyone who's ever been served a legislative subpoena like that basically said, go pound sand, I'm not going to answer it. And so what we had was uh, we had to research that. And so for the first time ever, I filed two resolutions in the Senate mm -hmm. that basically said to Planned Parenthood and to Pathology Services, the pathologist, you're going to come before the full Senate. We're going to convene as a, as a committee of the whole, which we've never done since I've been there. And we're going to allow you to answer for why you should not be held in contempt for your failure to comply with these subpoenas. And so did that uh, about a week and a half ago. And then yesterday, uh, with uh, with really only one business day to spare before mm -hmm. the 25th when we would have this, this hearing, uh, the pathology group through their attorney took the fifth. So they exercised their Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate themselves. So that's usually what people take when they've committed a crime, but you haven't proved it yet, right? No, but there are some issues out there, uh, inconsistencies, for example, in some of the information on, on what happens with uh, material from the pathology group, both from our hearings themselves and then also from disposal from a case in no, Indiana. The, the attorney general said there's nothing criminal happened here. Why are people <laughs> taking the fifth if nothing criminal happened? Well, generally, if you, you can't just take the fifth under any circumstance, but if there's some indicia that there's a reason to take the fifth, then we're not going to push that because they clearly have the right to take the fifth if they think that they would incriminate themselves in some context. Would you be investigating why they took the fifth? Well, here, here's the thing that's been very frustrating for me. And, and, and on top of that, Planned Parenthood, uh, as of yesterday, said they would produce the documents. So we're, they're not going to have to appear either and show cause why well, they shouldn't be held in contempt. And that's a good result because we get the documents ultimately we mm -hmm. subpoenaed. But the thing that's been really frustrating for me is as a senator and a former prosecutor, as a prosecutor, you got a big toolbox where you can investigate things. While we have the ability in the Senate to issue subpoenas and to hold hearings, we really don't have any follow-up ability. So I think this is a good outcome. We got the documents from Planned Parenthood that we subpoenaed, and then the pathology group takes the fifth. We can't do anything about that because they have a constitutional right to do that. But, you know, the, the one thing about the Attorney General's office, for example, yeah, is... We're in the heat of campaign season. You're running to be the Attorney General, the prohibitive frontrunner for the Republican Party. If you are the attorney general, will you investigate why this person's worried about incriminating themselves? Yeah, the ability to follow up, for example, on where we are right now, which we don't have in the Senate, absolutely I'd have that in the attorney general's office because that toolbox that the attorney general has to investigate and then follow through on those investigations, in fact, with charges, mm -hmm. if charges are appropriate, and, and again, you know, in the Senate, with the very small toolbox that we have at our at our disposal, you can't really get to that step. And plus, even if you could, we can't charge anybody. The Senate's not a prosecutorial body. But as a former prosecutor, it's very frustrating for me that we can't do that. But in the Attorney General's office, absolutely. You get to that next step. Well, first of all, you don't stop until you get all the information you request, and then ultimately make a, a prosecutorial determination of whether or not you're going to follow up. Folks say there's a political element to this, and then there's a political element to everything. But if people can just throw legislative subpoenas away, why would you ever come to hearings? Why well, would department directors ever come to hearings? Right, and that was the big issue. And I, and I think that's ultimately, you know, why we were able to move it so quickly is, you know, you have the underlying subject matter of abortion and what's mm -hmm. happening to aborted babies from the St. Louis Planned Parenthood. But on top of that, you've kind of got the integrity of the system, the integrity of the Senate's ability to ever get documents from anyone if, in fact, you could just simply say, I'm not going to comply and there's no follow through. Speaking of the campaign, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, traveling constantly. Uh, the grassroots support is just absolutely unbelievable, and I'm very proud and honored to have that. So uh, breaking down some of the issues that are, that are topical right now, there was a big issue with SGR 39. Uh, one of the candidates for governor came out 
in opposition to the SJR. Your opponent's been, your, I know you voted for it. Where's your opponent on the SJR 39? Well, you know, that's the thing about if, if you never have to take a public vote, you can tell mm -hmm. one group one thing and you can tell another group something else. And I guess that's, that's kind of what's going on there. But, you know, the one thing that I'm proud of, when you stand in that Senate and you take a vote, you know, you're on record, and, and that's your record, and I'm proud of my record. Uh, you know, and as, as SJ39, which I've been saying ever since the Supreme Court case came out last year, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, okay, you're going to tell a group that they have a right that, that really didn't exist before, but what are you going to do with everyone else whose rights, particularly under the First Amendment and, and freedom to practice religion, are impacted by that decision? And this is the type of thing that's going to take place in legislatures across the country. Well, the interesting parallel, though, is Eric Greitens came out against it, a pretty courageous move. Most of his funding is from out of state. A lot of his funding is from people that back gay rights causes. Your opponent is most of his funding is from out of state, and he's got some pretty big supporters, too, that, that are similar. I have, we haven't seen him. Then, then he's not elected official. He's not voting. But w have you had this discussion or a, any of these forms with him on SGR 39? No, we've only had a couple of debates, and uh, that issue really, really hasn't come up. But you're exactly right. I mean, the issue that you've got, where you've got somebody getting, you know, 80 percent of their money from either the East Coast or from California, and then from individuals that have specific uh, positions that are really contrary to, for example, contrary to things like SGR 39, that certainly raises a question. So uh, walking through the next steps here. On SGR 39, let's assume this comes back to the Senate. Do you believe it gets out of the Senate the second time? You know, we had that 40-hour filibuster from the Democrats, uh, longest one since I've been there, ultimately broke that filibuster by calling the previous question, which is you know, a very rare maneuver, but something that we all believe was appropriate to get that issue through. You know, where that goes, particularly with only a couple weeks left in the session, nobody knows. And so what we would hope is the House simply just picks that up and passes it. Well, uh, as the campaign goes on, uh, and especially as this issue of Planned Parenthood unfolds, we hope you'll come back this week in Missouri politics and keep us updated. I think we need to come back every week. We've always got a lot to talk about. So. <laughs> Sir, thank you for being on. Thank you. And we'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. But first, we'll leave you with this week's leading Missouri economic indicators. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more.
welcome back. We're now joined by our Opinion Maker panel, starting with Tracy McCreary, representative. Thanks for being back on the show. Glad to be here. Jane Duker, friend of the show, welcome back. Great to be here. Representative Robert Corneo of St. Charles County, glad to have, have you back, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. And finally, back on the show, we have to catch him when he's not traveling to Washington and all the other capitals of the world. Citizen of the world, Greg Keller, welcome back this week in Missouri Politics. Thank you. Let's start with SGR 39, so what was talked about in the Capitol today, uh, all week. Uh, looks like it'll be talked about it all next week. Uh, it, what happened with the bill and why did they not move out of emerging issues? Well, it's in emerging issues. I think they're having some discussions amongst, uh, amongst both the Republican and Democrat members. I think the approach of the bill is pretty simple. There are certain people who think that it should be within the power of the government to put out of business religious conservatives of whatever stripe from uh, whatever denomination who don't want to, uh, who, who refuse to uh, cave to big government and give in to their most deeply held and sincerely held religious beliefs. Uh, I think that both social conservatives are against this idea, and I think fiscal and limited government conservatives are against it as well, too. It simply should not be within the power of the government to put out of business small business owners because they stand up for their religious beliefs. Well, now, beliefs. Robert Cornell, I think the reason this issue is, in, is the issue it is is because business community, by and large, is against this. I think they don't see it as a legitimate issue, and they think it could cost them money, right? Correct. You know, what, what, I think one thing that's not really being talked about here is that this really only applies to services. You know, we're not talking about goods sitting on a shelf. We're talking about bakers, photographers, things like that. And, you know, as somebody from the party of Abe Lincoln who stopped slavery, I don't think we should force somebody into involuntary servitude to, to provide services to other people. Well, they're going to pay you, right? I mean, you're not <laughs> servitude. Yeah, but according to this, you know, you know, the bakers out in Oregon are, are getting fined, what, $35,000 a day? $150,000. Yeah. Tracy McGurry, so the, since statehood, there's 6 million Missourians. Since statehood, not one person's ever been afflicted by this. Right. Does that is that not mean maybe you wait a year or two to see if this actually happens? Well, these guys are on the wrong side of history on this, and business leaders from around the state have to compete for talent. We're in a global economy. Doing things like this sends a message that Missouri's backwards and hateful. It's the wrong thing to do. And why would we put a protection in the Constitution that allows employees to refuse to do their jobs? That's why business leaders are speaking out against this. Jane Duger, honestly, though, if you're a, a, a talented person being recruited by a Missouri company, do you say, well, oh, I got to read the state constitution before I agree to move to St. Louis? No. Really? Well, but no, but I do think, though, that people are very aware. That's why this is getting such the backlash that it is. And so people will be acutely aware. You say North Carolina, the first thing that pe comes in people's mind is, you know, the gay legislation and businesses are leaving. I mean, young people are acutely aware of those things and those kind of culture issues, and they're much more focused on culture. And, you know, St. Louis especially has been on the cutting edge cortex and all of the, the talent that we're trying to be, bring here and the new innovation. And this just says to that entire generation, no, we don't want you. And so I, I think it's it's morally wrong, it's fiscally irresponsible, and it just, it just feels like a stunt. And we need to stop doing this. If there was a person, if there was an honest to God person that owned a bakery who went to church every week, had his, had his tax receipts from going there, and went and someone he was trying to be nice, referred him to other people, and was sued. If that person sitting in that hearing room, this is a statute that passes, right? If this actually happened, it's a whole different argument, correct? Well, but but you you can already you know you can't be sued now for discriminating for firing a gay person, much less you know not baking them a cake. Well, there are, it's already in the law. Is it? Doesn't I mean, this change the dynamic? If someone's actually there's actually a person that this happened to. Well, I guess it could change the dynamic, but it's not going to happen. This is an election year stunt, and they're, you know, they're desperate to try to make Missouri more conservative, and they're still, I think the majority party, some of the conservatives are very frustrated that the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, and they're just grasping at straws with this issue. And I think politically there's an interesting dynamic. So I think yeah. if, the, if the medical marijuana and SJR 39 all appear on the November ballot, I mean, you're going to be getting, you know, liberals out in a way that is not going to happen now. And I think that that is, a, I think that's a, a political backlash that could be very, and you have Trump at the top of the ticket. I mean, this could be, this It'd be could great be the for Democrats' my, my party. Rick Keller, yeah. you, you deal with issues and candidates all over the nation. One thing with the Trump phenomenon, I don't think people really believe he's a rock college social conservative, but yet he wins their votes. Is it that those issues don't matter if you can make an economic case or break? I mean, there, there is a disconnect. I don't think he actually is an evangelical, right? 
Yeah, no, I don't think that even Donald Trump would necessarily tell you that he is, a, is an evangelical Christian. Mm -hmm. It's simply mathematically impossible to make the argument that this is not a huge winner of an issue for Republicans. And when you poll the Republican primary, it's a plus 50% issue on the Republican side. Um, this will pass uh, here in Missouri. Um, this is going to be popular yeah. amongst Missourians. It is popular amongst Missourians. And let's, rem let's remember what Democrats in the Missouri legislature are arguing against. They're arguing that the citizens of Missouri should not have the opportunity to vote on this. They, they want to make sure that Missourians don't have an opportunity to go to the ballot box and vote on this themselves because they want to tell them how to do well, it. Well, I mean, but if it was as popular, that popular might pass in the statute. Robert, in our lifetime, there was a gay marriage ban, overwhelmingly popular in this state. You saw, you know, you didn't see MasterCard and Monsanto testifying against that thing. Fast forward 10 years later, it's a different world. This is not as politically popular as it would have been. You would have never seen an almost unilateral you know, business community, the state chambers coming out against this. The issue is changing, and do you worry your party's on the right side of where that change is heading? No, kind of what, what Greg said, you know, it, this is something that is overwhelmingly, you know, to counter what Jane said, you know, Republicans are going to come out just as hard and force it if medical marijuana and, and SJR 39 get on the ballot. And so I think but Greg said that, you know, the polls are overwhelmingly there. But the there trend is not in favor of people wanting to pass laws that deal with gay people, right? I mean, the trend, the, the trends previously where they were overwhelmingly popular. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can say with the statewide election is overwhelmingly popular anymore, right? I mean, there is a trend going the other way here. I, uh, Jane, I guess what mm -hmm. I would say is, to me, every day someone that cares who's gay dies. And someone like Gussie Victor Vaughn is born who is very unlikely to care who's gay. Correct. My kids don't even understand, my teenagers don't even understand why we're having this argument, which is good. But and don't I'm you glad. think this passes the, if the even in its current form? Well, I think form, it passes, passes, but I think you bring out a lot of um, young people and, and people who, you know, the Republicans, they're coming out anyway. I mean, and the, the radical rightists are coming out anyway, but now you're going to bring a whole new part of the electric well, out. Well, theoretically, they don't know. I mean, that's oftentimes that's speculated. Them actually showing up isn't the most reliable thing. Ask Bernie Sanders, who can draw 30,000 people to a rally, but at that particular precinct, he gets 3,000 votes. I mean, they're not the most reliable. Maybe that'll be a difference in the trend. Well, yeah, I mean, remember in 2008, Barack Obama almost won Missouri. So you just don't know what turnout looks like. And it so is frightening. I, I would love that it. Is, that is scary. I think we're approaching this from the, the wrong perspective of who cares whether you're gay or not. It's, again, you're forcing people to provide services that they don't want to provide. And the argument here at the table is that this is not happening anywhere. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. The, the case that Robert talked about a little bit earlier, the baker in Oregon was fined $150,000 because they didn't want to take part in a gay wedding. Just the other day, there was news out of our neighboring state of Illinois, just over the river, bed and breakfast, owned by two evangelical Christians, said that they didn't want to, to have a gay wedding in their bed and breakfast. The Illinois court that had jurisdiction over it is, uh, has fined them $80,000 and has given them one year and said, inside of one year, you are going to hold this wedding, and we don't care if it's against your religious beliefs. So this whole idea that, Did that happened in Missouri, this totally the, different the, debate. This whole, uh, yeah, and so the argument from the other side is that we're standing on the tracks. We see a train coming our way. Let's wait until it hits us to do something about it. Well, uh, let me, let's talk about a person this week that isn't on the tracks anymore. He's on the train. That's Eric Greitens. Yeah. I, I mean, the, we were, the Missouri Times wrote a story that gave a statement that was wasn't exactly courageous leadership material, mm -hmm. but he followed up about six hours later and said, you know what, I'm against this. And I believe he's been talking to legislators. Mm -hmm. um, would you ever thought in our lifetime you'd have seen a, a candidate for governor, a major party Republican candidate, be on the gay rights side of the argument? No, I, I don't think you, you would have. Been, you know, and I think that was absolutely a wrong step from him in the sense that, you know, he's now, this would probably be, get, be put on the August ballot, in which case now he's Gone, going. That's the only thing that he's really defined himself from the rest of the field. And now yeah. all those people are going to turn out that this is the one issue, and he just ticked them off about it. So Greg I Geller, think he put himself in a box. I don't know what else to say except go. Yeah, I, it, it's totally in keeping with Eric Greitens' history. This is a guy who spent a, apparently his entire career as both a liberal and as a Democrat. This is a guy who went to the Democrat National Convention in 2008 sat in a, in a seat and cheered Barack Obama's uh, uh, speech there. So I don't think there's really any news here. I do think that what you just mentioned about supposedly he's been working the halls in Jefferson City on this issue, I think it's one thing to support it. I think that that's going to be extremely harmful to you in a Republican primary in this state. But if it is true that he actually was, to your point, lobbying in favor of this in the halls of Jefferson City, I think that's just adding salt to the wound. Well, Jay Drew, I think this was probably one of the best days of his campaign so far. I mean, I'm not sure if you know what an SJR is, 
you're probably not the people he's courting. I mean, I, I thought he, there's business people that would have never really probably considered voting for him mm -hmm. that saw him and it did, he did stand out from the field, right? I mean. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that the money Republicans, the business leaders, and everybody who's fighting against this right now are looking at a Republican candidate so they can, they can still vote Republican and still vote this issue and not, you know, hurt Missouri. And, and have businesses and NCAA and have all those opportunities for the state, you know, not jeopardized. So I think, and I think everybody is assuming this is going to be on the August ballot. The governor gets to decide which ballot this goes yeah, on. Yeah, I don't know that it will be. You know, and I, and again, I make the case for Democrats. You know, put it put it in mm -hmm. November, put it up there, with, and, and have all the Republicans it's talking about August, hot and gay. Not certainly August, right? Right. Not no. He can uh, do either. Especially here, Eric Greitens did have some support. It just came from Claire McCaskill, Mayor Slay. If you were running in a in a Republican in, in a Democratic primary for governor, would you want to tweet from Roy Blunt and from the mayor of Poplar Bluff, Missouri? I mean, it is a little the strange well, bedfellows here. You know, I point. represent a district that's 50-50, so I'm honored to have Republicans support me when I do the right thing. I think history will reflect kindly on Eric Greitens and others in the Republican Party that stand up and do the right thing. People are going to be embarrassed and ashamed of how they're acting right now. And he's going to be the one that says, "I was the only mm -hmm. Republican that said this was nonsense." Exactly. And he. I think he's planning for his future, and whatever that is, whether even if it's governor or even other aspirations, he I think he realizes in the long term that he's he's on the right yeah, side. Yeah, I, I do think it's probably a good day for him. I but do. I mean, I, I think that the crowd of folks pushing this might not be as crowd anyway, so it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. right. Let's talk about something else that uh, that was interesting. Speaking of the governor's race, the attorney general said no crimes here, Planned Parenthood, no 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 illegalities. Now people are taking the fifth, Robert Cornejo. There were folks that said this was a political witch hunt. Well, you don't take the fifth in political witch hunts, right? Correct. I mean, you know, you take the fifth if you're afraid you might incriminate yourself against some criminal wrongdoing. And, you know, like your point is, why, why are we taking the fifth? You know, you should be forthcoming and honest about what's happening. Greg Geller, this is an issue that, that Senator Schaefer started, actually closed down an abortion clinic over this. It was, a, it was another instance where events outside of Missouri with the, the, the tapes of finding out what happened with these body parts were actually brought to Missouri. Senator Schaefer led an effort to close down an abortion clinic and now subpoenas Planned Parenthood and they provided the documents and the pathologist takes the fifth. Uh, it's never good when taking the fifth is in the headlines of your organization, right? No, it never is. And you know, I really have to say, I mean, Senator Schaefer has really shown tremendous leadership on this issue. I can tell you that national pro-life activists are really looking at what he's doing, whether it's shutting down these abortion clinics or whether it's bringing these people and actually actually it, 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 uh, expecting them to show up and respond to subpoenas from the Senate. I think it's from a uh, strictly political standpoint, I think it's been very smart as well, too. Um, he's in a, obviously in a primary for, for mm -hmm. attorney general. I think most people thought that this Hawley guy was, was going to be to his right on, on, it, on some issues and hasn't turned out to be that way on this issue. Tracy, you've been a uh, defender of Planned Parenthoods. It, it takes away from the argument this is a political stunt when people start taking the fifth, right? I mean, that's that complicates well, it. Well, I'm no lawyer, but th your guest over there hit the nail on the head. This is an election year stunt. Senator Schaefer is using this to try to appear more to the right of his opponent in the attorney general's race. And he should be ashamed of himself. The women are legally allowed to have the right to choose. And to use women as footballs in this debate is insulting. And, you know, there if, if you really cared about life, there are so many truly pro-life issues the senator could be focusing on instead of doing this as some election year stunt. Jane Duger, you are a big fancy St. Louis lawyer and I am a simple <laughs> hillbilly from West Butler County, but if it's a political stunt, why are people taking the fifth? Well, I mean, people often take the fifth, and it's not really the fifth if you get punished for it, because you're, you have a right not to possibly incriminate yourself. And you have got an attorney general candidate, a senator, coming after you on a religious zealot diatribe. And so why not take the fifth and just say, I'm not engaging? I think you have a right to do that. And, and unless, you know, because mm -hmm. I think he said he was going That's to pursue. The attorney general he favors. He said there's nothing to see here. Right. People like, are taking the fifth. Right. I mean. <laughs> well, but I mean, I, and he said he's going to pursue whether these people can take the fifth because, you know, in order to do that, though, he will have to prove that they're not in any criminal danger. So does he want them to talk more or does he want to try to throw them in prison? And I think it will become clear that they've just decided not to engage. And, uh, you Robert know, I don't Cornejo, blame If it was the NRA taking the fifth, <laughs> do you believe Jane Duker would be saying what she's saying right now? Absolutely yeah. not. I mean, if these people are doing something against the law with aborted baby fetuses, they should be thrown in jail. Let's talk about something that we're about changing the law, uh, Robert. Medical marijuana came in the House this week. It Correct. didn't pass. What happened? Well, 
On Tuesday, there was first round approval in which the, the mm -hmm. House voted, I believe it was 91 to 59. So it did have um, support. Yeah. Thursday, Thursday morning, it came up for a vote. Uh, so, you know, there was roughly about 36 hours there. Uh, and all of a sudden now it, it didn't pass. And so I think in the, in the interim there, you saw that there was a, an association that, that engaged some of the Republican caucus. Uh, you start to see some flip, uh, votes flip. And, uh, you know, that association. Some Democratic votes flipped. Yeah. Tracy, I'll give you some Democrats flip their vote as well. I mean, right. this passes likely if the Democrats had voted for it the first time, vote for it the second time. What happened? Well, I voted yes both times. I think within my Democratic caucus, the reason some of the votes flipped is because they thought that it was crafted too narrowly. It only, um, the way the bill was drafted would only apply to those with cancer that are in hospice treatment. And I think a lot of people feel like we shouldn't get involved in the doctor-patient relationship and try to like narrowly define what a, a doctor can do. And so they just were uncomfortable. Well, right with now that. you can't do it at all. So right. it right. would be actually, it seemed to be a situation where making great enemy of good, right? I mean, Possibly. a little bizarre. I, I think that a no vote on Thursday was because they want to come back to the table and have it be more all encompassing where we actually let the doctor and the patient work out what's best for them. Greg Giller, it's odd to me that conservatives want to tell you what you can smoke. I mean, who cares if you smoke pot or not, right? I mean, I think it's a lesson, at least for the time being, in kind of politics 101. If you want yeah. to get something done at the public policy level or politically, you need to make sure that the people on your team are in agreement about the direction you're kind of going in. And, uh, and, and less than until the people who want to legalize marijuana in this state maybe have some conversations amongst themselves and decide upon a strategy of their own, I don't think you're going to see too much movement on this. Presumably, they'll do it eventually. Jada, does, isn't Greg right? I mean, this some form of this happens. I mean, most people just well, don't I think care. I think there's support for it. I think Why not do only that they don't care. Why the government tell find him who smokes yeah. what? And I and so and I actually agree with Greg. I think this is more about mm -hmm. sort of how you're getting it done. It's not what you want to do. It's how you're getting you know doing it. And I think that you know it would behoove to have more conversations, have more agreement. Um, if you don't get behind what we're seeing this with the uh, cigarette tax. Um, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that it would behoove them to, to get together. And so, a quick prediction. If uh, this goes, does medical marijuana pass this year? Does it reconsider? If it's on the ballot, does it pass? I think it does. Yeah. Does it pass at the ballot? It does pass at the ballot. Oh, at the ballot, does it pass? It depends how many petitions are on there. If, if there's more than one, then I think the public just votes no on all of them. Does this pass at the ballot? Medicinal, I think, wins statewide. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank all of you for being here. And I want to give a special thank you this week. In addition to the This Week in Missouri Politics viewer, viewership, Gussie Victor Fon was born. Mother, baby, and happy are all very healthy. I want to thank everybody for their very nice messages, Facebook and tweets. And we will see you this uh, next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This week in Missouri politics, brought to you in part by Sterling Bank.